but it's the most unique gun made in various lengths and widths. It's all about the comfort of being Indian. It's all about being whatever shape or size of whatever age. My first Sari was born when I was six years old, and we grew up when we were 16 and we went to college in a Sari. It meant you had become an adult. You could just walk about uh, with great confidence, and today it's the reverse. My contention is not against any form of dress. Every form of dress has a validity. But remember that you are living in a country with 45 degrees for seven or eight months of the year, and a pair of jeans is like wearing a piece of cardboard, in which you will sweat it out for most of the day. My uh, contention of the sari is that it is a garment capable of being refashioned constantly. It is not a kimono, it is not a form of dress that is structured, and if we knew some of the ways in which it was traditionally worn, you could go on reinventing it forever. So, the sari as it is worn in urban India today was invented by a single lady called Dhanadhan Nandini Tigor, who was a grand aunt of Rabindranath, and she went to Mumbai in a, with a chador because she wore the sari without a blouse and a petticoat, and she didn't know how to go out with her husband. She was stranded at home, so she adapted the party wearing style and what she could do and change to the left shoulder, taking it over the left, lengthened it from the five yard sari to almost six yards to make it feasible for her to wear. She came back to Kolkata to run a sari school for ladies who wanted to go out. And I'm doing exactly the reverse. A uh, hundred years later, I am reintroducing, if you want to show your body, at least do it in style. <laughs> don't show what you don't have. <laughs> if you have a big backside, you know, if you have a big backside, a big bust, uh, broad shoulders, spindly legs, horrible knees, please don't show them. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with the, uh, there are so many, uh, uh, sizes to the sari, and have we got the area on? Yes. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, basically what distinguishes the sari from a piece of fabric is that it has a body which is of a different texture to its two borders and its two end pieces. These are woven differently with a different density. The pattern carries the density because they perform a function. This carries the the uh, wear and tear of the floor and going around my waist, which I tie it first. This carries the wear and tear of going around my backside first. And then the final drape, which is used very often to carry things, to cover things, all kinds of us. So the way it's folded, also you can tell the length of it. Anyway, the body measure is what I'm going to tell you about. My first sari is only a one. How many threads go through the reed of the weave handle? That, and how many threads make up a finger width, which is my smallest border? That approximately is the width of my eyelids. We go from there to the two finger width border, which is here, which is approximately the width of my lips. We go from there to the three finger width border, which is approximately the width of my forehead. We go from there to the four-finger width border, which is approximately the width of my folded fingers, one over the other. And from there to the five-finger width border, which is approximately four and a half inches, which is the width of my folded hands. From here, we go to two widths of four and a half inches, which makes nine inches approximately, which is the cover of my head span of the widest border, which is approximately this. So there's a rationale to it. Two of these hand spans make a cubit, which is 18 inches. That's how saris were measured. The shortest being eight cubits, 
which is in front of you, and I'm going to show you a wearing style with my young colleague, um, which is eight cubits or four meters approximately. It's a halter style from North Bengal with a one shoulder halter. Quick and easy. You say it's very hard. I'm going to make a skirt, a dress out of sun. So that's my first style. From there, well, which is uh, uh, woven on a back strap loop. We go from there to Kerala, which is the only state which still remains predominantly white. White was the color of India, not because, not only because they couldn't extract dyes from easily from natural sources, but also because it was a sign of sophistication and quiet. Much of it. We'll start the with the Mohinya style. It's a 14 cubic sari, 7.5 meters, 6.5 meters, sorry. And on, this is how the stitch, unstitched garment, born before the stitch garment for the. Now, the most crucial thing is you tie it on your right, you tie it on your left, or do you tie it in the center? Because that determines how it will look eventually. about this style is that both the borders show as much. And this is where the fan of the South Indian dance form emerges from. The fan is the other border folded. From there, from the white state of Kerala, we go on to Karnataka, which has so many styles, the Halakri Vokaliga on the left, the Kashta between the legs styles, and it's a, se a series of crosses between cottons and silks mixed in a series of checks and, checks and stripes. We go yet to another very, very sporty style in the center from Karnataka and the Malikase and another uh, uh, style which is in the round. Round styles, long drapes, short drapes, they're all possible. Let's go. Okay, we're going to Goa, where weaving was banned for 250 years. And despite being banned, it flourished more when it was banned than when they got liberated, they dropped it all and imported it from Karnataka. Okay. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the wearing style of, uh, by the Kunbis. But what is interesting is the four flower flower, four f uh, petal flower and the six petal flower become the kuris for the Christian Kunbis of North Goa. Okay. Next. Uh, this is a fascinating slide from Maharashtra. Uh, this is the na day after Dipavali. They are worshipping the means of their livelihood. So that's my weavers on the right, worshipping the, the Paitani Sari. These are the, the, the milkmen worshipping the buffalo. And everything has been dressed for that purpose. Next. Uh, Maharashtra also brings you the strange conglomeration of what you see me wearing, which is if I don't have a required length, I just wear it with another piece of fabric. But what they've done down here with the red sari and the green on the other leg is basically they are the poorest communities who are uh, working through the day. They have to make two saris last the whole year till the next Dipavali. So what do they do? So when they wear off on the back side, they simply uh, take the longer ends of two saris and wear them together. That's how the one re leg red and one leg green comes about. Next. Uh, we come to Gujarat, which has the strange phenomena of uh, mostly skirts, but except for the tribal community and next, uh, the tribal community here in South Gujarat and in Saurashtra, and uh, here you have the tribals of Eastern Gujarat wearing it next to Madhidesh, the printed sari, and the rest wearing the skirt like sari. This has been tucked in between the legs for greater mobility. Otherwise, basically, the topmost, next, uh, the Parsis, part of the mercantile community, and they were the first ones to have introduced Chinese silks to India, and they were banned during the two world wars, and that's how Surat silks started 
in, uh, being woven in silk. But what is interesting about the Parsi Sari is they brought in the design directory of the chinoiserie of France and Europe and the Chinese birds of paradise for the first time into the saris of India. Let's go. Uh, this is Madhya Pradesh, where we celebrate both the shikhar of the temple, we celebrate on the marriage sari. That's why I was telling you about the marriage sari. It was as simple as that, with just a symbol of the Sindhur Dani marked on the marriage sari. It was sprinkled with haldi and kumkum, and that was it. Uh, and this, I tried to find out what this auspiciousness of the Sindhur Dani was. It carried a sava tola of Sindhur. Sava mein ankur phootta hai, deed mein tootta hai, aur pone do mein khatam ho jata hai. So it is a symbol of potential growth and uh, 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 therefore auspicious. Okay, let's go next. Uh, the Chaur Sari from Sarguja in Madhya Pradesh, uh, which is celebrating the rice grain in the border. Next, another man, uh, Chhattisgarh with its uh, various, another wearing style. And we come to UP with the coarse, the base kasari being the bound, which is again worn like a skirt, with a veil, a, a dupatta on the top, a four meter veil, which is, imitates the sari. But this is the only area in India where I found 20s and 40s count being woven with zari, which was very unique. Next. Uh, and of course, Banaras, which has absorbed every technique and design directory, not only from India, but from Persia, from Europe, from China. Next. Uh, Bihar. Next we come to Bihar, which has had the great gift of hand spinning. And like uh, my, uh, the speakers before me, uh, Veer Bhadraji said, we are a country that is wasting our natural talent. We should not be competing with machines, with China and the rest of Southeast Asia, a lot of which are military controlled societies. We are a democracy of whatever kind, uh, but we have the advantage we have the advantage of numbers, we have the advantage of widespread skills, and one of them is spinning and weaving. So if you were to support spinning and weaving and hand spinning, not on mechanized charkhas, but really the desi charkha, where I, I also cultivate cotton and spin it and uh, weave it into saris, uh, we could be the only country in five or ten years' time that has the skill for spinning and weaving and could have the monopoly in the world for that skill. Okay, next. Uh, Bihar, with, uh, with its plain colors used like a river around the body. Next. Uh, Bengal with its lal par, the celebration of Kali Ma. Next. And it always intrigued me, how was the muslin sari worn when it would be totally transparent without a blouse and petticoat? This is how it was traditionally kept. Heavily starched, gathered, kept in a figure of eight, so, like so in the cupboard, not on a flat iron. The hot iron came with the French in 1700 and something, and then after the sari became transparent. Next. Uh, that's the dhakka, which is the receding stripe in muga and, ma uh, muga and uh, cotton, and the great jamdani of Bengal. We come to Urisa. And I'm going to now show you, give you a pause, and we get into the next wearing style, next, uh, which is uh, from Orissa. And this, I will show you in center knot. And here you have a, another body measure. I will take you one, two, three cubits of the sari left on the left side, center knot. And I'm going to show you a slight variation of it further. <coughs> you have to put it here, sir. <laughs> okay. 
There's always a first time, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, it's okay. He's too afraid. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Stucking things into a plump waist can be dangerous. Okay. Uh, okay, it's gone in, finally. Okay. Uh, we go from there to Tamil Nadu, which is the epitome, the point of arrival. Uh, the color directory culminates, the design directory culminates. It's a bit like drawing a column and joining all the dots. Everything, the design directory freezes, and that is a culmination area. But what is very interesting is how color has increasingly be, uh, become prevalent in India from white, which was considered very sophisticated and very uh, appropriate, because I think, at one level, it's an expression of democracy. However good or bad it is, everybody wants to leave the background they come from. And that's a lot of the cause of the disappearance of all these wearing styles. We want to forget where we came from and go somewhere else. And we're all trying to get onto a bus going nowhere, friends. So let's think of that sometimes. Okay. Uh, Tamil Nadu, after Tamil Nadu, the Kanchipuram, great. And uh, next, we come to Andhra Pradesh. And I'm going to you, take you uh, through the back pleat style, but I'm going to show you the culminating sari as the Bogili Posi or the Grand Gown Sari of Andhra Pradesh. This is nine me uh, yards or eight and a half meters, 20 cubits, and that's my last style that I'm going to show you. Most of it will go into the pleats, but that's how the gown will be made. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, have you seen the ladies on the ramp in the gown? I'm giving you a, cheap, a cheaper and simpler way to wear a gown. Yeah, now. Everything, once it's stuck six inches deep down, it doesn't come off. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> the secret is, don't go less than six inches. Even at your burial. There you are. This is the grand... I'm going to go behind my curtain, as you see, I love it. Okay, uh, basically I'm going to show you at the end uh, just a two minute video clip from a dance theater. We're trying to popularize this, make uh, finer, finer uh, saris because we're being dumped with cheap Chinese silks in Banaras alone. 30,000 meters a day is being dumped into Banaras at the rate of 40 to 100 rupees a meter. And you know, weavers are becoming rickshaw pullers and uh, people who have to sell things on the roadside because they are losing their vocation. If you were taking a man from a vocation of skill to a higher skill, I can understand it. I justify it. If he's becoming uh, a great technician in a hardware uh, concern on computers, or he's become a watchmaker, or whatever you want as, uh, as a part of modern day development. But if you make him into a maker of roads, forgive me, that's not development. So this is what I seek to show to you, two minutes of the video clip, and then we'll go. Uh, is the video clip on? Yes. <laughs> Tell the story 
So they can tell the story of their own predicament. Thank you very much.